people first organizations will win in the future of work. Your only real asset is your people. We, we all, all want purpose-driven work. work. HR-led organization is I'm the sorry, but leaders don't lead empty desks and empty shop floors. Welcome to the People Strategy Leaders Show. I'm your host, Sri Chalapa, founder and president of Engagedly, and a serial entrepreneur in technology, films, and music. This is where we talk to people leaders, business strategists, and organizational savants about leading in the time of change. What is working, what is not working, and more importantly, what we should be thinking about. Stick around to the end of the show. We will reveal how you can be our next guest. And now, let's engage. Hello, and welcome to the People Strategy Leaders podcast. I am Sri Chalapa, your host. And today we have Claire Croft. Claire Croft is a, it's a dynamic founder of Corporate Punk. They're on a mission to revolutionize business performance through strategic commercial focused conversations. With over two decades of experience, they empower leaders to build high performing teams and eliminate barriers that hinder organizational potential. Well, welcome to the show, Claire. It's such an uh, ex- exciting time to have you join us from Oxford. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Well, change is so constant. And I, you know, we were talking earlier about how you work with organizations to manage change. And one of those things is really having an honest conversation, which is some, one of the things that you said is extremely important. So today, obviously, we're going to focus on the, the conversation part of that, right? So yeah. the power of conversation in unlocking human potential for business success is what we're going to focus on today. Um, mm-hmm. So when you talk to your clients, you know, the organizations, uh, what do you believe is the most important factor in really unlocking the potential through their people when you go into an organization and you know, managing the change they're going through? So I think for the leaders themselves, the most important thing for us is to normalize the fact that change is really hard, right? I think sometimes leaders get forgotten in this whole process, right? It is not easy to be a leader of change. You know, there's a lot of pressure. Everyone's got a boss, right? (laughs) And everybody's being told this needs to happen yesterday. And the world is more and more complicated than ever. And so being grounded and clear enough to be able to work out how should I lead this change in my business is hard. And most people struggle with it. So one of the most important things we start with is actually what is their lived experience, right? Because what we've got to get clear on from the outset is how are they feeling about leading this change right if we just jump straight into how you're going to lead your people we're sort of putting a band-aid over the severed head so to speak right you've got to start with the leaders and helping them to put words to what it is they're experiencing that does two jobs it gets them clear on the magnitude of the task ahead it gets them clear on what they really want and need to be different. And it also starts to build instant empathy for their people, right? Because when they get connected to what they're thinking and feeling and experiencing, it opens their minds up to the fact that, well, what could this be like for our people, right? So everything we do at the beginning of a client engagement is humanizing this. You know, all business really is, when you really distill it down, is people having conversations. Now, you may make widgets, you may produce creative products, but to get there, everybody does the same thing. They have a conversation. And so that's where we start is with a really good conversation with the leaders to work out where are you? Where do you want to get to? And what are you really feeling about it's going to take? And in doing that, start to broaden their minds beyond the task to start getting them to think about the fact that this is a people job, a genuine people job. It's not moving people around on a chessboard. It's human beings. And how do you want and need to connect with them? Yeah. So as you work with, I mean, you've been doing this for 20 some years um, Mm -hmm. at this point. When you look at 
organizations that have successfully pivoted and made that change. And usually it's because the environment changed or they have realized that technology is a disruptor at this point for their mm -hmm. uh, organization or whatever the reason may be. There are many different reasons. Sometimes it's an M&A that might be driving mm -hmm. that change. What are some of the key ingredients you've noticed of organizations and leaders who have successfully navigated that change versus mm -hmm. the ones who have not? So I think a very, very important factor is a belief in the capability of their people, right? So often in change where people go is what haven't we got to help us do this? You know, organizations are full of narratives about its people and people can be put into little boxes you know, well, so-and-so is only very good at tactical stuff. So-and-so is only very good at um, processes. You know, they, they create these quite fixed mindsets about their people. The ones who kind of go, I wonder what we've actually got present here. And, and actually, who could we start bringing into these conversations? <clears throat> Excuse me. And, and talking differently to them and seeing what might be below the surface that we've just not explored for some time because we are in our natural rhythm of how things get done about around here. So an openness to what might already be present in the organization to support change is, is very, very important. Secondly, I think the ones, the clients that we work with, they all start in the same place, but they are open to changing, is the relationship people have with time, right? Everything's got to be done now. So weirdly, I don't know what it's like over in the States, but we, we've had some experience of it. We certainly experience it in the UK and Europe. Action is the most valued activity in the world of work. Thinking has become an immensely devalued activity right? But change is complex. Change is challenging. So you can't just leap to action. Well, you can, but you'll take the wrong action. So what we always talk to our clients about is what is their relationship with time in achieving change? You know, we'll, we'll invariably in every conversation with every client get to a point where we kind of go, so just so we're clear, you've got no time to think about how to do this. You just want to get going. And you'll have all the time, presumably, to clear up the mess that ensues from not doing the right thing. From, you know, what we were talking about earlier about when you've talked at your people because you needed to get the communications plan up and running, but then nothing happens because you talked at them. You didn't talk to and with them, you know. So that becomes a, a very, very important factor. And then the the third thing I think is a willingness to sort of start small. So quite often when we're brought in to work with organizations, they've been trying to achieve some kind of change for six months, 12 months, 18 months, two years, right? And they're getting absolutely nowhere with it. And nine times out of 10, it's because they've got 12 work streams all up and running, right? They're flooding themselves with change activity and the organization is spinning as a result, right? And the consequence of that is it does a terrible unintended thing, which is it reaffirms what is often present uh, amongst employees, which is a belief that change isn't possible or a belief that change is going to be mishandled right so what we work with our clients to do is let's start small and let's experience change being possible and let's go from there right let's start building out belief that change actually can be possible we rounded out with a client at the back end of last year and the global chief exec we had to present to him said I'm not entirely sure how this has happened, but you've managed to support an entire transformation program through COVID remotely while we were going through one of the most challenging times our business has ever faced and our people have enjoyed the experience. People don't resist change. They resist change being done to them and they resist change being done badly, you know? Yeah, and I think the... You know, 
from personal experience, I can say that the most important thing about driving change is having an open dialogue and explaining and really getting their buy-in on why the change is necessary. Mm. If, if they don't get the why of the change, yeah. then you're not going to get the buy-in. And I think a lot of leaders probably mishandle that conversation where they're so, you know, driven to make the changes, they don't take time to step back and explain the why, get them into the fold, get them into mm-hmm. the buy-in. And maybe some good ideas that will actually, you know, from them that will actually change the way you want to drive change, right? Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. listening to them is very important. You know, obviously, we're talking about power of conversations here. Um, mm-hmm. Give me an example of where you've seen this done really well. Is there a specific client, without naming the client, obviously, um, that you've mm-hmm. seen this done really, really well? Yeah, and I just want to pick up on your point about buying, because that's one of our red flag phrases at Corporate Punk, because what buying tends to really mean is you're rather part either part of the steamroller or part of the pavement, right? We're just going to tell you how it is and you can either get on with us or you're just going to be flattened in the process. You know, all these words and phrases that businesses use to self-soothe and kid themselves that we're doing change with our people, not to them. And buy-in is a classic one where it's like, we'll just talk at you about the what and not the why. And we'll relentlessly talk at you about the what until you acquiesce and kind of go with it. So, you know, I really resonate with what you were saying there. Where we've seen it done very, very well, leaders have to give a sense of direction of travel, right? Complete blank sheet freedom is not actually that helpful in bringing people into change, right? Because it's a real risk to open people's minds, allow them to go and explore and allow themselves to go into territories that you fundamentally know the business is never, ever going to back and be capable of backing, right? Mm-hmm. So some some base, like we call it the straw man view of what the change really needs to embody and deliver and achieve. We will have pushed our clients, by the way, to think about what does it need to have achieved for the business and the people within it, right? And that's the that's the... That's the beginning part of doing change with not to, right? That the people have actually um, featured right from the start. Our clients where it's really successful then is where you bring them into conversations that are not necessarily at the level of what behaviours do we want, right? Because there are behaviours that are known and wanted a lot of the time. What we get our people to do uh, people to do is come in and start experiencing working in ways that inspire those behaviors so for example cross-functional collaboration we've done some brilliant work in how you bring people together on live business opportunities or challenges or tasks and inspire them to collaborate, expi- inspire them to challenge and discuss and debate with one another, working in a completely different way to what they're used to, and then tell us how was that for them? What worked, what didn't work? How would they evolve it and change it? What was missing in how we try to inspire them to work? So, so much of change happens at the level of adjectives being pushed around on a page, right? And everybody can go, yes, we'd like to be innovative until you experience what it takes to be. Being innovative is not easy, right? It requires conflict. It requires discussion. It requires debate. So what we've seen worked really well is create the conditions for the way desired ways of working to be experienced and then allow the people to really feed back unfiltered on what that experience was like for them. So going back to your point about buy-in, um, mm. you, you, you're not a fan of that word uh, of, of buy-in. What word would you be using instead? And what does that look like differently than the word buy-in? We try really hard to avoid labels at Corporate Punk because there's so many terms in business get misused and abused. So for example, this is a classic. So agility, 
right? Means 84,000 different things to 84,000 different people and can have unintended consequences of driving undesirable behavior. We were working with a client and we were doing this massive session and the most senior person rocked up 25 minutes late and said, sorry, I've been being a bit agile this morning, here, there and everywhere. It's like, no, that's not being agile. That's not managing your diary, right? So we try to avoid labelling. And what we try to talk about is how do we want to engage with one another? Engagement is a word we're very comfortable to use and stick to what we're doing because engagement by its very nature implies exchange right two way there is there is a dynamism that's happening here so what we would talk about is what engagement conversations do you want to have about your ambition about your vision about your goals how do you want to engage with people in a conversation about that mm-hmm. but we would never we, we if anyone says to us we've got a communications plan we're like, so we're just going to talk at them then, are we? You know, and and so for us, that's the one word we are comfortable with. But we generally try to avoid typical business phrases. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, because there are we are just so in tune with those words because we've been using them in different corporate environments. And then you carry mm-hmm. that over to your next business, next work you do and the mm-hmm. next company you work for and so on and so forth. And then eventually before mm-hmm. you know everybody using the same word, but they mean different things sometimes, you know, Absolutely. but it's a good thing in, if you use it in the way I intend, it, I'm saying where you actually have a conversation, you mm. explain the problem, you explain the why and get their yeah. feedback so that we are all aligned. Now, not everyone will necessarily agree. So the word I like to use is align, not necessarily agree, right? Yeah. Sometimes you yeah. don't, don't agree and it's, and it's fine because you don't want to be an agreeable group. Because mm. like you said, innovation mm. is hard. It requires conflict. And if you're all a, a fully agreeable group, then the loudest person in the room is the one always getting their way. And it's not the best way always, right? Mm. Mm. Oh. Absolutely. Absolutely. We always talk about, you know, when people say we want to get to consensus. Well, no, you don't. What you want to get to is commitment, right? So, and what that requires is everybody to feel like their views have been heard, that their views have been debated and explored. And when we have felt heard, even if we don't fully agree with the final decision, we will back it because we have played our part in getting to that outcome, right? So commitment is is another um, build on what you were describing. We would talk commitment, not consensus. Consensus will paralyze you, right? Consensus is... First of all, I don't even know if it's desirable, even if you could mm. do it, because that means you're building an agreeable group. Yes, um, exactly. Sometimes change is disruptive and mm. and it's not something that is ordinary, normal course of things, right? Sometimes change mm. is so out of the box, and I'm not saying it has to be, but sometimes it is out of the box that everybody is a little scared. I'm like, are we really going to do this? This is so out mm-hmm. of what we normally do. Mm-hmm. But when the bridge is on fire, you got to jump, <laughs> you know? Yeah. You yeah. hope that the fire just magically goes off. And sometimes you just mm-hmm. got to jump, you know? And I think those are some other things that uh, some organizations do because sometimes not changing is a change, is a choice of change, not changing yes. itself, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, coming back to conversations, you know, do you have an example of a, um, a barrier that you helped a client overcome through these conversations um, and strategic thinking? Yeah. I mean, look, one of the things that we do a lot with our clients, we have a training course called Uncomfortable Conversations, right? Because nobody knows how to resolve conflict healthily and quickly right we are there's a lot of conflict avoidance particularly in UK culture I would say but we sort of see it in every business from every sector from all over the world you know people don't know how to disagree well or they don't know how to navigate conflict well one of our um most favorite moments was working with a, a, a they were a creative agency and creative agencies are 
are quite well known for being conflict averse, right? You know, they they are there are creative souls. There's a lot of sort of just trying to protect one another. But of course, when you're trying to be creative, you need to be able to disagree. But you also are a service provider and the relationship between creative agency and clients can also be quite challenging. So our Uncomfortable Conversations training course helps people to explore their relationship with conflict, helps them to explore other people's experience of conflict and then equips them with the tools they need to be able to go and have different conversations when challenge and conflict has arisen and there was this one lady on the course who was the quietest lady very very conflict avoidant um like to the point she would get quite anxious about conflict right But she didn't know that was a problem for her because the context in which she was working was conflict avoidant as well, right? But she was willing after our training to go and have a conversation with the client who had been underpaying them for the volume of work that they had been doing. And she was able to have that conversation and the client turned around and said, God, yeah, you're right. And they recouped four times the cost of the training through that one phone call, right? So the They'd been swimming in a pool of a conflict avoidance, not knowing that was their problem. We could see it in how they were showing up. So we we sort of said, could we explore this with some of your people, like what conflict is all about in this business? And through the training, managed to recoup thousands upon thousands of pounds worth of revenue, which right. felt really felt great from where we were sat, but that they were able to then, they, they literally enhanced their bottom line. Yeah. So I'm going to ask a question. I don't know if you've experienced this or not, but where you've seen change being mishandled um, and what was potentially wrong in those cases. I I don't know if it was having good conversations or not, but if that would be helpful to understand as well. It's a difficult one to talk about where we've seen, we've physically seen change mishandled because we tend to be brought in when in the aftermath, right? Right, right? So quite often clients come to us when they've tried a couple of times and it hasn't worked and they're ready to embrace a different way of navigating change. But what we see is what has led to the lack of success in their efforts is absolutely at the level of They can often be clear on what it is they want to do, but there is no connection to the current reality. So they can't work out what is it genuinely going to require of and with our people to get to our desired outcomes. Because what's never happening in the business is the conversations about how are we doing things? Everyone talks about performance results. Are we on track? Are we off track? Everybody talks about problems, problems. We've got to solve problems. But nobody stops and goes, how are we contributing to either our success or our lack of success? There is very little meaningful evaluation. So what ends up happening is lots of hidden barriers because people are trained to only talk about a couple of facets within their business headline Mm -hmm. performance goals you know sometimes it's which is depart you know the best department worst department those sorts of conversations happen but the how are we helping or hindering ourselves conversations don't how does that conversation look like like what where does where do you what kind of questions are you asking specifically? Uh, we tailor everything for individual clients, right? But one of the ways we create the conditions for people to open up quite honestly, quite quickly, is we have a diagnostic tool that we've built um, with business psychologists and it measures an organization's readiness for change. And it's got three dimensions. And within each dimension, there's three factors. So it looks at things like systemic flexibility, autonomy, um, connection to vision, values, all those sorts of facets, okay, about 
indicators that the world of psychology and our experience has sort of shared with us predicts an organization's readiness for change. We will survey the organization. We don't need a big sample, but we can cut the data by tenure, geographical location, department, so on and so forth. And what that creates is an objective data set that says, here is where there's real strength in your readiness for change, and here's some areas that need attention. And then the most important question we can ask when we bring that kind of insight to our clients is, how does that resonate with you? Mm-hmm. Right? Um, 9.999 times out of 10, they go, yeah, that is exactly what's going on here. And so data can be very, very, very helpful in allowing people and permitting people to start opening up about what they know to be true but haven't felt able to say. Hmm. Hmm. Very interesting. Well, Claire, it's been a pleasure talking to you about having these conversations to drive change. Um, You know, good leaders, the ones who bring people into the conversations, Mm -hmm. you know, not so good leaders, tell the people what to do and then the train stops and they step away. So we talked about that. Absolutely. Um, So Claire, how can people reach out to you, learn more about you and your work? and read more about uh, you know your uh, experience in the books and articles you've written yeah so the best place to find us is corporatepunk.com one thing we always advocate people take a look on there we produce uh, weekly a very short sharp uh, e-newsletter called small change and it offers a very pithy focused insight into what effective change requires of leaders and poses a question for reflection of the reader and a bit of self-evaluation of how am I showing up to lead change. So signing up to that newsletter can be a very helpful way to start to get a feel for what we see is important in terms of your attention um, and consideration as a change leader. And that's at corporatepunk.com. Excellent. Well, thank you, Claire. Um, hope you stay warm. I heard it's pretty thank cold. Thank so, um, <laughs> I appreciate your time. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Sri Chalapa here. Thank you so much for listening to the People Strategy Leaders Podcast. If you are a successful leader or a people strategist who would like to be on this program, please visit engagedly.com slash people strategy leaders podcast. If you got something out of this interview, would you share this episode on social media? If you know someone that would be a great guest, tag them on social media to let them know about the show and include the hashtag people strategy leaders. I love seeing your posts and guest suggestions. We are regularly putting out new episodes and content to make sure you don't miss any episodes. Go ahead and subscribe your thumbs up ratings and reviews go a long way to help promote the show and mean a lot to me and my team want to know more follow me on linkedin and twitter at sri chalapa thanks for listening we will see you next time and thank you to patrick ramsey sound engineer at kalinga production studios for recording and mixing this show